So what is there to love? What is there... I don't know if I can say this. Okay, I'll try it again. What is there to love about the battle of integration? It's a real hard question. You've got vertical integration with God. you got horizontal integration with life. The version you're going through right this second is essentially the same as you'll be going through a billion years from now. So if you don't like it now, how are you going to like it then? And if you're supposed to like it now, well, I'm not sure where to like is the proper word. If you're supposed to want it now, then you'll want it then. Why would you want it now? See, all these questions is amazing. All these questions keep on going back to the character of God. So all of these issues end up revealing aspects of his nature, his character, his thought pattern. Him. And frankly, that would be one of the reasons to want to battle integration is to get a, a better sense of what it's like for God to be God, to be closer to Him, to understand Him better. That's a really valid reason why to want the battle of integration. It's vertical and it's horizontal. It's vertical and it's horizontal for Him. Vertical for Him is I'm throwing myself down before truth that I decree be free. I am throwing myself down before the truth that I decree be free. That's how he wants to live. This is his choice about his own life. And it's always been his choice and it will always be his choice. He can change. He won't. Each him. Father, Son, Spirit. They're all making that same choice. And they're looking at each other at the same time. That's their horizontal. Because we're below. So in a sense, we're part of the vertical. Vertical up, truth be free. Vertical down, we're the expression of truth being free. Because it's free to be low. Truth be free, truth be free high, God looks up at what he made and saw that it was good. Truth be free, God looks down at the truth he made and sees that it is good. Makes sure that it is good. Ensures that it's good. Keeps it going. Which means that the conflict, the struggle, the battle, keeps on going. And one of the reasons to want to go into this, because I mean, you could just choose to say, oh boy, right now, if this is the truth, if this is the eternal state, and I'm representing to you as best with the best of my knowledge and ability, if this is the eternal state, then I don't want it. I can understand that. Half the time, I think the same way. I want to quit a thousand times a day. But, I get back up again. Use one John one nine. Thank you, Dan. Used it just now. But this is how he thinks. I wish I could be giving a different answer. I don't like the answer, which tends to, you know, buttress the idea that it's true. If truth is free, it can't mean anything else. If it's God, Son, God, Father, God, Spirit. Three of them giving to each other. What else is there? What does God give to God? If what they want to do is throw themselves down and have an endless battle to support and see the realization of truth be free no matter how bad, including hell forever, then what other conclusion can you draw? If you have one, let me know. I'm serious. 
Okay, so one of the reasons to want the battle is that by going through it, it's a kind of fellowship, and that's what. Thank you, Dad. He threw that at me. It's a kind. When I said fellowship, he threw at me this verse, where Paul says, "If by some means I pause in the Greek, if by any means I may attain, attain is the wrong word, it reach the destination of the exit resurrection." It's around Philippians three ten through fourteen. Okay, to the, for the fellowship of his sufferings, for the purpose of conforming to his death, singular in the Greek, but I keep calling it deaths plural when I remember it. He's making a play on Isaiah fifty three eight, which in the Hebrew is plural. Bemotai, in the Hebrew. So it's like going through the many deaths of Christ while he lived here. Because you really go through many deaths. Every day is a death. That's a famous Jewish expression, anyhow. But every day really is a death. Today is your life. And it ends tonight. Then you get a new life tomorrow. So make the most of today is basic, you know, carpe diem kind of thing. But the, the big point to get out of this is that every single moment dies. Every single moment lives. You are constantly dying and you are constantly living. And you just threw that at me. Where was that? Where Paul said, the I die daily. Thank you, Dad. I don't know where that is. It's in Corinthians, I think. Or he said, I die daily. You are dying daily. You're dying momentarily. I am not the same person as I was when I woke up this morning. Neither are you. You're either going toward a goal or going away from a goal. And the goal you're going toward is either better than or worse than the goal that you were going toward that you're now dead to. And then you're reversing course. You zigzag, 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 zigzag. And the zigzag process is what Paul talks about in Romans 7. I know the world. I know the law is really good and true. And God is wonderful. And then I look at my body and I see a different law at work. The law of sin. And then he ends the chapter saying, you know, who will rescue us from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. Okay? And that's pretty much it. Every day. And so Paul in Romans 8 ends up calling, thank you, Dad, a pregnancy. Romans 8, 11. Specifically. When it says the world is in travail. The word travail in the King James is a, um, a word that's often used for pregnancy. A pregnancy about to give labor, give birth. Uh, the, Paul is famous for constantly using sexual analogies. Okay, he's famous to the scholars for constantly doing that. He's, Paul's writing is kind of crude, supposedly. I don't, I don't find it crude, but then I don't know the Greek as well as some of those scholars. They, they, they find his language rather crude. And some of them think that his Greek isn't all that good. Actually, it is. They had the same problem with Peter. Because Paul and Peter are both constantly creating new grammatical structures and neologisms out of the Greek. That means that they were good at it. You can only do that really well when you're good at it. Peter was really good at the Greek. I don't know where they got the idea that Peter was not. Just because he's very creative in his grammar. Very creative. Paul, too. But the point is, is that, you know, they love this, they love the fight. Paul learned to love the fight. What was that one you just said? The, the part where he beats himself up daily? That, that boat, I'm not boxing in the air, I think is the English translation. That, that passage, wherever that is. Um, Romans, maybe? Colossians? And... He learned to love the fight. It brings you closer to God. It creates a fellowship of his sufferings for the purpose of conforming to his death. And then 314, which he recalls to my mind all the time, which I remember in the Greek, so I have to translate it. Katas kopon dioko, ai stobraveon, tehesan oklesios, tuteun Christo Jesu. Okay. Katas kopon dioko, onward toward the goal I march. Ha, ha, ha. 
It's bam, 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 bam. Catasco pontioco. I stole a veil. Te sano gracious. Tu te u in Cristo Jesu. Plod, plod, plod. Plod, plod, plod. Like he's a soldier marching. So catasco pontioco. Toward the goal I march. To try and get the cadence to be the same in English. Okay? Catasco pontioco. Toward the goal I march. Okay? And then... Des an oclesius. To the high upward calling. Tu teu in Cristo Jesu. Of God in Christ Jesus. By means of Christ Jesus. Or by agency of Christ Jesus. Or just flat in. Say ta 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 ta. That's how the battle works. You're a foot soldier. How do you like that? Well, soldiers do. There's some kind of, I don't know, when you do it long enough, you just don't want to do anything else. We all have met, hopefully, guys who were in the war, whether it's the Iraq War, the Afghan War, and in my generation, Vietnam War, who they got addicted to being soldiers. They did a tour, they come back to the States, and they don't like to stay here very long, and they sign up again for another tour. They get to where they really like the endless fighting, despite the fact it's constantly uncomfortable, and your life is constantly in danger. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of in some of that mode on the spiritual life. Because I couldn't just sit here. But, you know, what what is it about wanting the battle? Well, to know him and the power of his resurrection for the purpose of conforming to his death. Thank you, Dad. He just threw that at me. I had to say it to remember what he said. That's in Philippians 3, 10 through 14, before the Katoska poem, which is 3, 14. All right. Well, then I know you better today, tomorrow, the next day. So I'll get up. So I'll go through this battle. It causes me to know you. And of course, that's instant gratification. I'm, I'm, I'm in you. I'm with you. You and me. That's the cross. That's why Christ went to the cross. And he called it a joy. It's right there in Hebrews 12 too. But, you know, we humans, we think of joy as feel good. I'm not so sure that it is. What it does, for sure, I know, is it's something you just don't want to live without. I'd, I'd rather be in hell with him than heaven anywhere else. Now, is that joy? Well, it's certainly a desire. And it, it takes over. It wins, it triumphs, but there's no like ha ha feeling that goes with it. Yeah, you won. Yeah, you're victorious. And all I can do is cry. So I don't know if you call that feeling. And the crying isn't because it hurts, the crying is because it's true. Is that what the eternal state's going to be like all the time? I don't know if I like that idea. But if that's what he likes, this is where he is, what do you do? Now, it's true that when you fall in love, deeply, that the object of your love takes over your life. Because you just don't want to live any other way anymore. And it can be very destructive, as we've all, you know, seen many movies of. You know, it depends on who the object is, or what the object is. But when you deeply fall in love with whatever or whoever the object is, your life is that object now. And you might be incompetent at fulfilling the love that you have, but literally you're living for the object. That's how God lives for truth. What was it? Psalm, what was it? Psalm 89, 14, and 15. Truth and justice go before you. Righteousness is your throne. Something like that. That's the actual verse that he wanted. 
I just don't remember the wording. But it's something like that. And there are a lot of verses like those too. That's how he thinks. That's how he feels, so to speak. Feeling isn't really the proper word for God. You know, his attitudes. Feeling is an emotion. It's a body thing. Anyway, I'm getting the hiccups again, so I'm going to sign off.